Okay. So the, the we are recording this session so the people who um were not able to make it with the new time are still able to see it. Thank you for joining us for this virtual workshop on data to the rescue. Penguins need our help. We're going to be um, sharing with you this resource and talking a lot about data literacy and what it looks like and how we can support data literacy in out of school time. And I believe, let's see if I can figure this out, we have a poll that I want to do as we're getting started. This is our icebreaker. So I can move to the icebreaker slide too. So um, we want to know if data literacy is something that you are doing or considering doing in your program, whatever that looks like. We realize we have a wide variety of different people on that what a program means for you may be a little bit different than the person next to you on the Zoom screen, but we want to hear your point of view on this. Can everybody see the poll? Because it's telling me that there's four people, and I know there's more than four people in the Zoom room. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the poll? Okay. Thank you. Well, let's show you what the results look like. So it looks like most of us are at the point where we're considering how data literacy fits into the programming that we do, which is perfect. That's where we want to be in the discussion today, because um, we have some resources that will help you kind of envision what that might look like and how it could fit into your program. All right, so we have a, a team of people who are facilitating today. My name is Sandra Ferrix, and I'm part of the Click to Science, Click to Computer Science team. If you've joined one of our other virtual workshops, then you've probably seen my face before. Ann O'Connor is also here from our team and will be helping make sure everything keeps running. But we also have a couple of guests who are here um, as experts for this particular topic. So Janice, you wanna introduce yourself first? Sure, I'd be happy to. So my name's Janice McDonald. I'm at uh, Rutgers University as the STEM agent in the Department of 4-H Youth Development here at Rutgers. Um, I also wear other hats. I also serve as a marine educator here in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences, where I work very closely with a broad range of um, marine and environmental scientists in supporting their um, community engagement, education, and outreach um, initiatives. Uh, mostly through their grant getting. And we'll be talking more about that in, in the program today. Thanks. And and this is Janice's project that she knows inside and out. So we're lucky to have her expertise on that. Kimberly, you want to introduce yourself as well? Uh, my name is Kimberly Sankey. I'm an assistant extension professor in statistics at the University of Nebraska. Um, most of my work involves uh, gamification, making statistics, data literacy, and math fun for everyone. Um, historically, my focus has been on undergraduate students, but I am expanding rapidly into the K-12 space, and I am happy to be here today. Thank you. All right, let's hear a little bit more about um, Data to the Rescue. Okay, sure. I'll jump in and give you a little context to get us started. Um, as I mentioned, I work really closely with a broad range of scientists here at Rutgers, many of whom are studying climate change. 
Uh, so when a um, National Science Foundation Dear Colleague letter came out, uh, specifically around improving polar literacy, uh, we uh, we jumped on the opportunity to to think about that. And as Sandra mentioned, in an out of school time context, and you know, really around these major points here of you know communicating to educators and and young people about the impacts of climate change and how they're unfolding at this incredibly accelerated rate in the polar regions on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which is the, the focus area of this curriculum that we'll be sharing today. Um, it is the fastest winter warming place on Earth. Um, so uh, so sharing that and what that means is, is really important. Um, how sea level uh, ice, melting ice shelves and, and glaciers are increasing our sea level. Um, so this, this local to global connection of how what we do here impacts what happens globally and vice versa, that we're just one big connected ocean <laughs> uh, planet and uh, and making those connections for kids and, and adults, of course. And then the political aspect of it, geopolitical aspect of it, that, you know, we, we need things from the environment. Uh, there are a lot of ecosystem services that the environment provides, but uh, balancing that stress um, and the impacts of climate change are, are really important. Um, so those were the kind of big ideas that motivated the Dear Colleague letter and, and gave us a context for this project. And as you can see, this is a screen grab of our website, polar-ice.org, where everything we've done on this topic sort of lives. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, so what we'll talk about today is our Data to the Rescue program, which we were fortunate to get funding from the ASL program, the Advancing Informal Science Learning Program at NSF. It is, um, it's a program that we've developed that can be done in or out of school, preferably in an out of school context is what it was developed for. It's roughly eight sessions. Um, it does have a computer connection uh, where laptops or Chromebooks can be used to help kids with um, exploring real data from the um, Western Antarctic Peninsula. We focus on building those data skills, um, including orienting, interpreting, and synthesizing, drawing conclusions from data. Uh, and we want to have this fun component, our STEAM component, where we integrate the arts. Um, and we call that a data jam. And I'll explain more about what that means um, as we move through. Uh, so this project started right uh, in the middle of COVID. Um, so our ability to interact in person with kids was obviously like the entire world severely <laughs> inhibited uh, from doing that. So we developed what we call this research club model, which we're, we're very proud of now, where kids are able to access the materials ahead of time. They receive a postcard uh, from our scientist, Dr. Megan Semino, um, that allows them and directs them to online resources that prepare them for a club meeting that can be done preferably now in person, but could be done online as well in Zoom, and then uh, encourages them to do more. What we used to, you know, what we commonly refer to as extension activities, where we encourage them to explore these ideas in the context of their community. So it's sort of this three-part progression, if you will, um, that allows them to uh, to move through the, the the topic area. And the whole idea, again, behind this is to build their STEM skills, uh, particularly around data literacy, which we'll talk more about, and maybe more importantly, in many ways, their, their STEM identity, making them feel like they're part of the research team um, that is going to Antarctica. And as you can see in our first um, club meeting, <laughs> they meet Dr. Megan Semino, who is a biologist who studies penguins in Antarctica. She's at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's part of a larger team of scientists. Uh, the chief scientist is here at Rutgers, Dr. Oscar Schofield, um, and he works very closely with Megan. We chose her uh, because she works with charismatic organisms like penguins and also because she's young and very engaging, and we thought the kids would respond really well to her. So she uh, has this introductory letter, Dear Explorers, I need you on my team. Uh, and she kind of explains the context of how they're going to go move through the project. These is a screen grab uh, to your left there of some of the postcards that uh, are available in the curriculum kit that uh, can be given to the kids um, that allow them to see 
um, the tasks before each club meeting that they can do to prepare themselves to become part of the research team. Uh, so in this case, in club meeting one, they're packing their bags and going to the polar regions. So the online materials include a drag and drop, what would I pack, what do I bring uh, on a personal level, on a research level, on a survival level <laughs> to go to Antarctica. Um, and they, they prepare, mentally prepare for that and figure out how they will serve as a team member. So building those leadership skills and thinking about um, what jobs there are to work on a, as a team of scientists. So it's a very team science approach, which um, is ubiquitous now in the science world. Nobody does independent research anymore. Everybody works as part of teams. So we, we focus on that in club meeting one and two. Okay, next slide. The, the idea that you, you bring your whole self to your work is one of the things I really like about how this curriculum approaches science. And for as much time as the scientists spend together in Palmer Station, they really have to, it, it, you can't just like, you don't just work with people for a few hours and then you leave and, and you, you have to be your whole self there and you have to have the interpersonal skills to to make that work. So I really like how it it blends the interpersonal skills and mental health along with the science skills in the curriculum. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. That's great. Um, the next thing I'll do is just kind of give you sort of the, the learning objectives from different points of view here. What we wanted the students to know, kind of the knowledge base or cognitive goals, were really that, you know, the polar regions are dominated by ice. Um, and they're very geographically different, the Arctic versus the Antarctic. Um, ice is really a habitat for most of the critters that live there, a very important part of the, the habitat landscape. Um, and that climate change is really affecting the amount of ice at the poles, and this has local and global impacts, as, as we talked about. Um, and as Sandra just said, there, there are teams of scientists that are going to collect data there to document these changes um, over time. And it's just so critical. They do have to dedicate so much of their lives <laughs> to do that, to travel and to be there for months on end away from their families. And, and being able to firsthand document that, serve as witness to this change is really um, a big part of what we wanted to communicate. Um, that they use a variety of tools um, that help them make those observations and record those observations. That's where the data literacy piece comes in. And then we really focus on, through the data jam, uh, the importance of this asking questions, right? That if we ask questions and we interpret and ask questions of the data, we can tell a story and it, interpret uh, those stories uh, through the data. And that's, that's a central goal to the, to the program. But um, as Sandra mentioned, there's also um, there's also kind of affective goals and behavioral goals that are attached to this. And as she alluded to earlier, the self-efficacy part um, regarding data is really, really central. Um, and having that uh, process of discovery that we don't have all the answers is really, really important. Leaving that open-endedness that there's a role for people uh, to join the science team and become part of you know, the inquiry um, is really important. Uh, we wanted to give them a sense of what it feels like to be in these polar regions. And um, in terms of behavioral goals, what do, what do we do with that information, right? Does that depress us? Does that make us anxious? We hope not. <laughs> what we really hope is that, yes and, right? It, it does create a sense of anxiety in all of us, but we need to use that to make changes over time in our own local areas and making those connections. Um, and we want them to, you know, have that emotional connection to the polar regions, even though many of us will never go there. Um, but getting to hear from scientists and work with real data from there will hopefully make that connection feel more real and encourage them to participate in other science programs. And then uh, more specifically, we, we really want to focus on the data skills. This is something my group here at Rutgers has been focused on for a long time. Um, is how do we build data skills in young people and improve graph reading and interpretation. In this case, we chose a tool called CODAP, Common Online Data Analysis Platform, that was developed with another NSF grant. 
and we use that as our tool or our object <laughs> for exploring how how kids can uh, build their own data skills. Um, and, you know, using that data to really emphasize the importance of the polar regions and the threats they face. Uh, so that interpretive aspect, and then, of course, the creative or science communication aspect. Um, and in this case, we used uh, collaborations with a local theater group called the George Street Playhouse to think about these data jams and accessing that creative artistic side of kids to think about how they can use that to interpret data and uh, communicate science effectively to their peers. So just a few words about where we did this and how we tested it. From the summer of 2020 to the spring of 2023, uh, we implemented um, and iterated on this program in uh, all of these states that you see pictured here. Um, sometimes uh, multiple times, obviously in New Jersey, we had uh, more connections and more access. Uh, we did have partners at Ohio State. Um, Jason Cervenick uh, there also piloted a lot of our materials and some of his own materials there to explore polar literacy. Um, and you can see kind of the breadth and scope of where where our partners lived and how they interacted with it. For example, in Pennsylvania, that was in Philadelphia at the Franklin Institute in a, a teen leadership program that they run. And um, in, uh, let's see, in um, Alaska, that was a group of uh, kids from the North Slope who tested the program. And that was really interesting looking at it from Alaska and having them compare their landscape to Antarctica. So a lot of really interesting kind of implementations of this and different points of view of the of the kids that from a regional perspective. Okay, and I think Sandra you're going to take over here. Yeah, give you a chance to catch your breath. Thanks for really setting the stage for that and helping us see where how the curriculum was developed and, and really what those purposes were. We're going to get into seeing some of the activities and, and a chance to taste what that curriculum is. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what exactly we mean when we say data literacy and what that looks like, because I think for most of us, that's a, a new concept where we're not really um, thinking about that in terms of after school programming, though I think that's going to change soon. Um, and we're using a framework that was developed by Kristen Hunter Thompson and Molly Schaffler to really help clarify what is data literacy, what are the skills that young people need, and also how are those developed? Um, how do they develop over time? They build on one another. Um, some You have to have some basic understandings before you can um, really develop some of the later skills. So. Um, this is the framework that we're using on click to computer science as we're adding components around data literacy to, to that site. And this idea that what data literacy means is that you have the skills to get data, explore data, and infer meaning from data it really helps us um, think about what exactly we're trying to accomplish for young people. So you'll see these um, practices reflected throughout the curriculum. So as students are, are learning about data literacy, they're learning how to ask questions and, and um, how, how asking, how they ask the questions is important, how to generate and quantify data, how to organize and process that data. Those are the, the skills that they're developing through the curriculum activities that is going to um, give them the capacity to understand what data literacy means, what it means to use data, how it is used in our world today and how it affects their life today. Um, because we're seeing that in order to really be successful in life, in a world that is so driven with data and big data and AI and the influences it has on their world, they need these skills. So we'll be talking more about the practices or the skills of, of knowing how to get data, explore data and infer meaning from that data throughout the discussion of the curriculum. And 
in particular, um, but my slides are going too fast. These are the, the skills that were identified for the data to the rescue curriculum and are developed there. And Janice, you want to talk a little bit about how you saw those skills and how they build? Yeah, for sure. So this also comes from uh, Kristen Hunter Thompson's work, who is incredible. She used to work here at Rutgers and, and more recently has opened her own company called Datespire. And the slide that you just saw previous was uh, is been her framework and design, as Sandra mentioned. But she also has this amazing, um, she calls it the building blocks of data literacy. And if you go to her Datespire website, you'll be able to access that. But it's basically a scope and sequence over grade level of what data skills show up when uh, and you know, sort of ability uh, levels. Um, and it helps, really helpful tool for curriculum developers to figure out what's age appropriate and, um, and you know, what we can utilize uh, at that level for, for different age level kids. Um, so what we did is we worked with her as a consultant to take a look at our, our curriculum arc of what we wanted to, the story we wanted to tell. And she helped us um, develop the, the use, pull from her building blocks document and choose the data skills that uh, she felt we could best um, articulate in the curriculum. It turns out we chose 11. We started with like some crazy number of over 20 of them. And with her help, we pared them down to about 11 skills, different data categories that you see there. Um, and then the skills, as you'll notice, are mostly middle school. And if I didn't mention this before, I should have. Um, this is really geared for fifth to eighth grade um, as, a, as a program. And you'll notice, you know, most of the skills that we've identified fall on that block, but not exclusively. There are a few that are are lower. I'm just giving you, you know, the screen grab here of it, but um, it's in our facilitator's guide if to look at it more closely. But basically, we try to pick this subset of skills and repeat them at least twice over the course of the eight sessions. So it wasn't just a one off. It was, you know, something that could be taught a minimum of two times over the course of the curriculum. So this was probably the more challenging part of designing the curriculum was was making um, this this sort of data literacy sequence work within the the content and materials. It was really easy to tell kids about Antarctica and focus on the scientists. It was less easy to find um, the skills that they need and the data match to the data sets, the authentic data sets from the scientists and match to the story that we wanted to tell that was age appropriate. So this this was really the heart of the work and you know, of course, we're, we were grateful for her support to help us think that through. All right. So now I think, I think we're going to dive into what, what the curriculum actually looks like and give you a chance to see that. Yes, absolutely. So in this next section of the workshop, we're going to focus um, specifically on how this curriculum supports the data literacy skills Janice and Sandra have been discussing so far. Um, and so in Dr. Hunter Thomas's framework, um, there get data, explore data, and infer meaning from data. So these types of engaging activities are going to help develop the skills to get data. And getting data means they learn to generate data, quantify data, and organize and process their data. So the curriculum piece that supports get data is actually using little M&M predictions. So I know you all have eaten these delicious bags of fun size M&Ms. Um, and when you open them up, they're a pseudo random distribution of, of, of M&Ms, right? And that's something that the youth can tangibly touch and manipulate and count. Um, so this works really well with baggies of M&Ms or baggies of Skittles or other candies. Um, I've actually also successfully used this activity with a little baggie of pom-poms in a food-free uh, environment. So um, it works with anything that has a bunch of different colors and is manipulatable. But the activity is also really flexible and has an online sorter. So if you don't have access to any manipulatives um, or don't want to provide them to your youth, uh, Sandra has shared in the chat a link to the m, &M sorter activity. So let's explore this together. So I encourage you all to click on this link and I'll talk you through what we're doing. 
So over here on the M&M sorter and simulator page, um, you can or you, you or youth can drag each of your um, M&Ms represented by these colored circles into the appropriate color. So you can drag the um, red down to the red, blue over to the blue, etc. And once you've got them all moved or some of them moved, you can click check and check will tell you how many you've got them correct or not. Uh, they show up like with a little green check mark if they're right. Um, and if they're wrong, I think they turn red. Um, so every time you refresh this page, the sorter page uh, has the same distribution. But if you scroll down on the page, we can also generate a new data set of M&Ms, um, and you can use this to, um, to collect data so you can talk about it as a group. Um, and so if you click the press for a new set button, a new distribution comes up, and each time is a new distribution. You can change the number of candies, um, maybe to be more accessible with the either with the group you're using or um, I found that a package of M&Ms contains between 15 and 17 candies. So you could be, you know, more accurate like that. So now every youth has their own data set, right? Either they opened a package of candies, they opened a package of pom-poms, or they've generated this distribution using the website support. And then um, you can, uh, share those share those distributions um, with the students and graph them. So let's everybody has it open, right? Let's say we all have 20, 20 candies. So change that little box to 20. Press for a new set. And I want everybody here to report the number of green candies they have in the chat. Get it ready. Don't click enter yet. We'll do a waterfall. So you've typed the number of green, and in three, two, one, enter. So we've got three, four, 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 one, five, two. Awesome. So that's demonstrating that there is some amount of variance or variability in our data. And you can also use it to um, start conversations with youth. Do you expect these, all of us to have the same number of green candies? Do you expect um, would you be really surprised if you opened it up and they were all green candies? That'd be pretty alarming, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, so that is a great example of how youth can emulate scientists in actually collecting and sharing their data. Um, mm -hmm. Has anybody done this activity previously? Have you got it, had experience with it? I know Kimberly's done it with a groups of different ages from children through um, college students. Looks like it's new for most of our groups. So that's exciting. A lot of times when we think about having students get data, we think about developing a survey or having them go out and, and do it or, or doing a survey in the group of how many people have cats or, or, or some other attribute. This is a, a another way to let them generate their own sets of data. And I think it's kind of fun too, because M&M's fun. Oh, um, we have a video. Yes, so next we are going to watch this video. These are actual, actual youth enjoying this actual activity. So after we watch it together, we will, um, have a brief discussion about it. So as you're watching, I want you to consider um, what do you notice in the video um, and be ready to share that after the video is over.
some predictions using candy. If you guys opened, right, um, a small fun size mm -hmm, of M&Ms, what colors would you expect to see? Is every bag of M&Ms the same? See how a small bag of M&M candies can help learners engage with data in a way that is fun and builds data literacy. In this activity, learners collect a simple data set using candies and explore different ways to represent their data. So now let's put on our, like, our prediction hats. Let's put on our data collection role. What do you think about the colors you'd expect to see in the M&M bag? Adrian? We're going to see like green, red, and blue, also a little bit brown. Okay, a lot of the colors you see on your crayon package, right? Would you be surprised if you open up this bag that Miss Marissa is passing out and you had all orange? You would be. You think that might happen? Do you think we can predict the frequencies of colors in M&M's bags? We could do that. We could predict the frequency, right? Here we see learners working in small groups using M&M candies to emulate how scientists collect and share data. By sorting and counting the frequency of each color, they represent their observations in a bar chart. This M&M collection activity represents the same type of experimental design that would help scientists understand what is happening to the penguin population in Antarctica. Just as youth did with the M&Ms, scientists are counting and sorting penguin data. Give him his data, tell him his data. Three blue, one green, three yellow, three orange, and zero brown. The Kalman Online Data Analysis Platform, or CODAP for short, is an online app designed to help learners engage in data manipulation and see different patterns and observations. See how easily they enter their data and begin to experiment with how it is displayed. I like how you guys are playing with this. Esther, what are you doing to yours? Are you changing up your, um, your data display? Yeah. How so? Like I was uh, taking my data and displaying it. <coughs> You were displaying it in like a scatter? Are you changing it to bars? I'm gonna change it to bars. Why? That's interesting that you said that. Because like, I feel like bars are just like easier to work with. How many people are first timers on this? First timer on this code app. Do you think that the scientists use some kind of tool similar to this to help them look at all of their data? Okay, they probably do. Okay, D uh, Mariana? You can change the colors. You can change the colors? I mean, would you do that for us as well, love? What color you want them to go to, Mariana? Mm, orange. Go to, go to orange? Ooh. Wow, did everybody just see how that data just kind of like almost? Yeah. How do we change it to a bar graph? I like how you just did that. I mean, can we go back over that when you right clicked it? You click on the entire graph and the bar pops up on the So you clicked on the entire graph and then that bar, that toolbar, came up. Which graph display do you, do you prefer? Bar. Why? It's a lot easier. In this case, it's easier for you to see it? So you're saying to me, hey, Ms. Hesafiran, Amin should probably change that graph to a bar graph in this system as opposed to a point? But that might not be the case for all kinds of data. No, you can put it in percent. You can put that in percent? Yeah, where? Where? Um, the ruler. The ruler? The focus of this activity is to help learners practice new ways to engage with the m and data they collected. The goal is to encourage curiosity in exploring the patterns they see in the data. How can we wrap this up, everybody? What can we say for our, like, summarizing statements, concluding statements? What were some of the comments that your group members had? Lucas? Um, that there's a random amount in each bag. Like, I got 13, and he got uh, 15. Okay. And I got 16. Okay, so you kind of were sharing your numbers. To compare our numbers of M&Ms, and we would, um, basically think about how many like that, how that com like compares to the penguins, if they're alive then. That's so cool that you just said that. You're like, we're scientists, Ms. Sessafiaran. We're over here dealing with data. We're dealing with M&Ms. And we're comparing what each other has. Pretty cool. We can control these axes with how we want it to be displayed. 
how we want the intervals to look, right? And that might determine how our graph is maybe easier for other people to understand it, right? Would that be something? In this video, you saw learners building their data literacy by collecting, recording, and labeling their observations. They orient themselves to the data by asking questions like, what kind of graph is this? What are the parts of the graph? What does this data mean to me? Learners use their critical thinking skills to find trends and patterns in the data. Awesome. So as you were watching that video, um, I have a question for you. What did you notice about the video? In Dr. Hunter Thompson's framework, the first block is getting data. And in getting data, we're focusing on generating data and processing and organizing data. So did you see the, any youth generating data in that video? I'm seeing some head nods. Yes, yes. Put it in the chat, unmute yourselves. The sun is changing, so I'm looking washed out. Yes, perfect. Yeah, the youth were generating their own data sets, right? Each youth had their own package of M&Ms and was able to generate data, just like real scientists, because they were real scientists. Then the next, and then another part of that framework, yes, Becky, youth were inputting their data and analyzing it. So the other part of get data is processing and organizing our data. So there were a couple ways we saw youth do that in this video. Did anybody catch one? Bar graphs, yeah, absolutely. Choosing a graph model. Yes, so we use the, the youth in that video used code app to, to organize their data. Uh, there was also a secret little one um, that we only saw briefly in the, in the video that wasn't discussed, but there is also a place in the workshop work, worksheets to um, physically organize the M&Ms into their little color spots just like in the M&M sorter activity online. So students can create these sort of pseudo bar charts um, physically on paper, and then also see how that extends to uh, CODAP or, or some other graphing modality. Yes, onto the paper chart. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly, Patricia. So beyond getting data, uh, the next step in the framework is exploring data, right? So exploring data, our youth are going to work on visualizations and graphs to describe and analyze their patterns. Um, and so we're going to watch part of um, a video, just a few seconds, um, to see youth build their data literacy skills by exploring some data. So we're going to look at this brief segment real quick and then we're gonna try it for ourselves. Sorry, Sandra, I moved too fast. <laughs> Let me take a minute to get to the right starting place. 47, I think, is where I'm supposed to start. Each of these videos is about four to six minutes long. So you got to see the whole of the, the previous video. This one, we're just going to jump into the middle. Creativity to make up stories that describe the data trend. If you were to tell a story about this picture, what might your story include? Lucas? Um, the older the person, the more movies they watch. As a scientist, when we're collecting data, scientists want to display that data, right? And with We'll be doing that as well. And we want to kind of look at it with some fresh eyes. Awesome. So um, we want to see or we want to help youth observe how different sets of data can relate to each other and um, how they might tell a story. So one of the activities in Data to the Rescue is a card game. Um, that's called Data Stories or Let's Play a Card Game. And somebody, I'm sure, will put it in the chat shortly. Um, and we're going to play that game ourselves. I'm getting there. 
No worries. <laughs> So this is the graph that they were looking at. Do we want to start with that one or go to a different uh, one? Let's start at the second one. So here in the second one, we have on the x-axis years and on the uh, y-axis amount of people that don't use cell phones. And we'd ask the youth to um, look at this data together. So how could we tell a story in just a sentence or two about, about this relationship? Are you asking us to actually say, okay. So yeah. like uh, more people you, Fewer people, wait, oh, it's a double negative. Um, more people use cell phones than used to. There we go. Yeah, more right? people yeah, okay. use cell phones now than they used to. What could be a reason for that? As shown by this data. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. I was thinking that maybe cell phones were um, were not invented that long ago. Um, so as they came into the market, more people used cell phones. That's a great way. Another creative, um, the picture went strange. Oh, there it is. Another creative one I've seen is um, as people get older, um, they're they're less likely to be engaged in their phone. So they so sometimes this years on the bottom is interpreted as uh, years old versus years that have passed. One of the explanations the kids gave the youth, sorry, in, in, in our session was back in the old days, you could only use your phone to make phone calls. And, and so as there became more functions, more ways to use your phones, more people are using them because there, there's more things you can do on your phones, not just make phone calls. I love that explanation. Um, and we really want to um, promote creative explanations when you're doing this activity or a similar activities that are different than the prescribed one in the curriculum. So if you click that turn um, button, yeah, on the back of the card, it gives you um, an explanation that could be true, um, but creative explanations in, are encouraged because it empowers youth to think like a scientist and develop their skills as they start to explore data. Um, in general, there are many good explanations, but all good explanations fit the data in the chart and bring a different idea or point of view into the discussion. Uh, let's look at one more. So if you click the little right arrow and we can go to card three, this one, um, is on the x-axis, it says time spent trick-or-treating. On the y-axis, it says amount of candy. And the graph itself is a down-facing or negative parabola. So how do we think we could tell a story that would explain this data? I'll give you a moment to consider it. Either put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Any ideas? Uh, the only thing I can think of is that fewer people give out candy earlier and later. So if you spend a longer amount of time, you, you'll you'll get more candy, but like it'll depend when. But I feel like that doesn't quite fit the graph and I'm, I'm sort of struggling with that a little bit. That's all right. That's a really interesting uh, interpretation. I think that would be a great way to interpret it, Becky. And then I see someone on the chat here. 
The longer you're trick-or-treating, the more candy you accumulate, but you start eating the candy. So you're left with more candy. Yeah, absolutely. So it starts off, your candy bag is empty. As you're going around to the houses, it's filling up and you're really excited. And then you're getting so tired of walking. So you start eating the candy. And by the time you get back to your home, you're out of candy again. Woo! I also like uh, Patricia's explanation the time you go depend on how much you get at the beginning maybe not all of the homes are open yet ready for trick-or-treating and at the end some of them are out of candy wild so all three of those explanations are totally valid they're good explanations because they fit the data in the chart and they bring a different idea or point of view to the discussion great job team they turn the house lights off yeah exactly when there's no more candy <laughs> exactly. Um, and so those are the first two pieces of framework from Dr. Hunter Thompson. Get data, where we saw the youth um, actually getting their own data um, by using M&Ms or the M&M sorter activity. Then exploring data and seeing how different datas can relate or tell a story here in this card game. And for the third, um, the third tenet, which is infer meaning, we'll go back to Janice. Thanks, Kimberly. That was great. Yeah, it's uh these are really practice lessons. You know, this exploring data that Kimberly just walked us through are really preparation for getting the kids to think about how they're going to interpret Dr. Samino's data. And I just put in the chat a link to the M&M kind of coup de gras moment here where after they've collected their own data, they share their observations as a class and they practice using the code app tool um, which is is totally in prep for exploring the penguin data in the code app tool so um so it just gives them a little bit of practice you know before they they move in the dragging and the dropping of the uh, in this case the m m colors against the different contributors right um, we give them a starter set and then they can add their own names and we can see that variability that kimberly walked us through of how um how variable you know m m numbers of colors are in each bag so just gives them you know that that jump start right to be able to um learn how to use the code app tool which you know, we found often in the pilot studies with over the 1500 kids that the kids really had no problem with uh, using the code app tool. Um, sometimes facilitators did, right? Which is very typical of kids and technology, right? So, um, and I'll also mention that the, the facilitator's guide has lots of orientation videos of how to use code app to improve the facilitator kind of confidence level with working with these tools. And you can see, Sandra's very easily clicking and moving through it. Um, the nice thing is, is if if they mess up, you can close the window, open it again and start over. There's no um, it's not a high risk, you know, in terms of losing data. It's very, very simple to manipulate and and work with. So the things Kimberly, again, just walked us through the first parts of the model are getting data and exploring data um, and practicing with that charty party activity that she just walked us through. The next step is about inferring meaning from data, and this is where we take them back to the penguins um, and we actually introduce them to a, um, a an actual real real world data set of three different species of penguins that we find on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, the Adeli penguins, the Gentoo and the chin strap. The chin strap are the ones you'll recognize from uh, from Happy Feet, the movie. Um, the Adeli are the native, um, you know, sort of penguins along the peninsula. The Gentoos are more of a, I'll call them invasive, but not really. They, they're moving in from the, um, from the southern regions and, and are, you know, just invading the space, right? They're, they're moving into that space, whereas the Adeli were the original true polar species, um, the Gentoo are subpolar species. So what this does, this little, um, this little data story that we've prepared for the kids is uh, just a way of walking them through the time series, the data that we've collected since the 1970s of where these three uh, species of penguins have gone. 
So uh, Sandra can click us through it. Um, this is on the postcard. You'll see, you saw the picture to the left there of the postcard. So they get this as an assignment before their club meeting to kind of walk through this historical timeline and take a look at what's going on with the data. So uh, let's go see what's going on here. This is just text. Maybe click the next one and we'll start to see the graph. There we go. So as you can see along the x axis are the years that the data has been collected and I'll, I'll mention that this data is collected very hands on. It's literally a clicker that you would use um, in a fair or a large group, you know, sort of to count heads right. Um, in this case, they count breeding pairs, which is the male and the female that um, produce uh, chicks each breeding cycle. Uh, and they go a very special time of the year to do this, which is usually the January, February time frame, which is uh, spring and, and uh, early spring in uh, Antarctic and the Southern um, Hemisphere. And the uh, breeding pairs are literally counted using a clicker. Um, so this, if you look at this, there, so 14,000 breeding pairs, we double that number for the actual number of penguins, right? Um, so you can see the first part of this graph, um, you know, it's fairly stable, right? We had a dip around 1985 there, but generally speaking, quite stable. And then if we click it again, we see the, the, the 90s through the 2000s there, we get these dramatic declines, right, in the number of breeding pairs of the Adeli, right? So... Okay, so what does that look like altogether? You see the whole graph there. We've got the decline in 85 and, and a huge dip in 2000 and then the steady decline from there, right? So what is that about? That's 38 years of data of someone going down every year and collecting this information. So if we click on the next one, you'll see, just to point out to the kids, what's going on here? You know, what? just sort of point out those you know dramatic declines, those aberrant declines. Uh, in both of those years and have them just think about that. Is that an anomaly, an anomalous uh, data point, or is there something going on here? We don't really know, right? We're just looking at the whole. So let's take a look at the Gen 2s next. Or, yeah, chin straps, sorry, chin straps next. So notice too that this is the same uh, X axis, but the Y changes, right, with the number of breeding pairs. So in this case, we're only going up to 400 breeding pairs. And if you remember in the Adeli um, graph, we were going up to 14,000, right? So there's a scale difference there. So although this looks a little bit more variable, you'll see when we put it on the same scale, um, I think Sandra can click the next one and we'll see that Gen 2, same idea, right? We're only going up to 4,000 breeding pairs in this case. And it looks like there's a steady increase, right? In the Gen 2s, as I mentioned, was a subpolar species moving in to this polar region. Um, so um, if we click the next one, you'll see them all at once, right? And the kids can see them at the same scale, which is a really important discussion point, right? That when we look at these things all on the same scale, we see different patterns, right? Than we do on different, uh, uh, different scales. So this one's really important and they can click them all or click one on and off to explore the different species at different times. Um, and yeah, that's another good point, Patricia, that the Gen 2s didn't move in until the 90s, right? You don't see them in the early 70s and early 80s. They moved in as a subpolar species um, in the 90s. Excellent observation. And sometimes the kids will say that too. We've had many, many a group notice that trend that you just noticed, which is great, right? That's the whole point of this is to have them look for those ideas and those trends in the data and, and just wonder to notice and wonder why that is happening, right? That's what we're looking for here with these question prompts and with this simple walkthrough of, of the, the patterns, right? And, you know, that sort of gives them that, that grounding of looking at the reasons that might explain these trends. That's our, that's our goal here. One of the things that I noticed is here, I could, it looked like there was a lot of variability in the, the chin strap pairs, you know, there's, peaks and, and, and valleys in, in the data, but when I get to the same scale as the other species, that variability is kind of assumed into the scale of difference on the graph. So it's really helpful, I think, to see it in both ways, to, to see the data 
just an individual species where you can see all the variability within that data set. And then to see all three of them together and see how the, there seems to be some interaction here, doesn't there, between the different species? Yeah, quite a few different, yeah, different uh, trends over time for these different species. And that hopefully sets up a lot of questions for the kids in their minds. And in most cases, we found that to be true. The, the next big step after working through this, and keep in mind, they get this as a postcard assignment. So this is done on their own time before their club meeting. In the club meeting, they, uh, they come with their, hopefully the same questions that Patricia and others raised of, you know, what's going on here? Why, you know, why are the Gentoos only showing up in the 90s? You know, what are, what are some of the trends we're seeing here? Have a general discussion about it. And then we move into habitat investigation. Um, well, let's look at what's going on in the habitat. And we learn to read different types of maps. In this case, they're looking at ice coverage. Um, so that's part of the habitat in, in Antarctica, right? It's a huge part of the habitat. And there are some questions here that help, you know, help them navigate how to, the legends of how to read these maps. Um, it just sort of prompts, if you will, to get them to notice the legend and, and really interpret what they're seeing. They're certainly not required that I've seen many a facilitator use them as group prompts that they answer as a group. Others have had the kids try to do it in small groups. It's really, um, really up to you how you want to handle the, you know, this exploration of the of the habitat maps. But they look at that um, and they start to think about, you know, some other data points that might contribute to uh, explaining those trends, those long term um, time series trends that, that you just looked at in the three populations. And then finally, um, finally, we move on to taking that information and really questions. thinking about um, what it all means. How do we ask questions of this? And I think Sandra is going to play you a clip of my favorite video that we, we co-produced with uh, Sandra and Kimberly and, and Anne. Um, called asking questions and this one really gets at the heart of what we hope will happen with the kids that they will interpret and um, and synthesize what they've learned so let's take a look at this one. Janice I think we're doing okay on time, what do you think about playing the, this whole video so that they can. I think this one's the most important, so I would be fine with that yeah okay let's do that. Go back to YouTube. Okay. We're going to spend some time on something called question land. We're going to use a method for collecting your questions in the land of questions. Seeing themselves as someone who understands the data and can ask questions about it helps young people develop a STEM identity. See how learners take a critical look at the data they've been examining and ask a lot of questions. They learn that scientists also have lots of questions about their research data. If you take a moment in time to read over your question and then once you're done, Let's focus on this board. All right, go ahead and read out for us, uh, Lucas. The, the birder team is very ex interested in figuring out what this data tells us about the penguins. Write down as many questions about the penguin data that you can in your research journal. We're going to put our questions on post-it notes. Maybe you fit one question on a post-it and then you can certainly take away. We really just want to share out and look at each other's wonderings. In this activity, learners experience how asking questions drives scientific research forward. They think about the important questions they have about the data they have been exploring. What do you think the next move would be with all of these questions? Compare them to your Ah, so we go back to the analyzing. Comparing them, maybe some questions have the same topic. So maybe we could move the post-its on the actual sheet if they have a common inquiry. This takes time, people, so take your time to read them over. Learners are taught how to use the question formulation technique, or QFT, 
to brainstorm questions about the data trends they've observed. They are exploring the connections between sea ice habitat, penguin populations, and the potential impacts of climate change. Has everybody had a chance to kind of like look over the questions at their table? Do you think we're ready to switch? So we're trying to see if we can fly to the stadiums that are somehow similar to each other. Okay. Because it's still... Pair them up. You can the pair them up. You can move them on this chart paper. Actually, that's the beauty of the post-its. Uh-huh. Why is it just to the same population? But I wonder if this one is not wrong because Adelie's eye isn't facing at all. Yeah. Um, we can talk more about all of them. We can talk mostly about two of them. Mm-hmm. But they kind of have almost the same idea. Okay, so you want to put, them, put it in like... The, she the wants middle. to put those together? Like Is that okay like that? Yeah. Like here? It's perfectly fine. In agreement. I love it. And these two were connected by... They both talk about like why, like if gentles mm -hmm. increase or decrease, how they affect the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we talk about these questions, what types of questions do we have? How can we like sum this up into categories? Okay, so um, a lot of them talk about climate change, and a lot of them talk about how, um, how like food sources and how like the environment will change and how they will change with it. Um, they also mostly talk about the the environmental life, like the penguin. The the questions we're asking about like like their lifestyles, like how and like um. What might be affecting the lifestyle? Were there some questions that were geared towards that? Like, how so? Expand upon on that. Uh, so they explained in different ways, like why or how, like uh, the, the the population declined or increased. All right, we're gonna share this video right now. Are you ready for this? Hi, I'm Ashley Hart Adams, and congratulations, you made it. That's Your data is hot off the presses. And now that we've made our way out of questions land, where we asked a whole lot of questions, Dr. Megan Samino, a biological oceanographer, is here to explain why the penguins need your help. So it's really important to have this long-term data, especially at this study site, Palmer Station, because it's one of the most rapidly warming regions in the world, and penguins are really sensitive species and they give us some clues into what the environment is doing and you can tell that by how well their population is doing or how good the parents are doing at raising chicks. The main goal of my work is to understand the decline in the Adelie penguin population and the rise in the Gen 2 population and this is a really interesting problem because both of these species eat krill yet their populations are doing the opposite thing in the same place. So we're really focused in on studying how the landscape could be affecting their populations, how changing ocean conditions could be affecting. But if you notice, Dr. Samino, you guys had the same questions as her. You did. Did you hear her asking about like the environment and the landscape and the development? She showed the egg, right? So I think that was over in that group and your group. You guys, in just the short amount of time that your questions are very, are almost exact, like the scientists that are down there. Young people build their data literacy by learning how to ask questions of the data. They practice examining data, making claims, and asking what the data indicates by applying the three C's of data literacy, curiosity, creativity, and critical thinking. They are building their skills and developing a STEM identity. Yeah, it, there's something empowering about that, you know, asking questions uh, from your own interpretation and then hearing from the scientists that yours are very similar. Um, we have found consistently in the evaluation data from our pilots that um, that that is is really helpful in building a STEM identity. We had statistically significant increases in student response to identity related questions on pre and post surveys, and especially uh, significant for um, kids from overburdened school districts that are underserved and underrepresented in STEM. So that was particularly rewarding for us, and and um, I think we were, were sort of on to something in terms of using that QFT technique and 
and having that pairing with, you know, scientists discussing their own thoughts. And again, leaving that open endedness of we don't have all the answers, we're still trying to figure it out um, is really important. Um, so, uh, so that that part of it is really important to me. I've had the most fun with with session six of eight, <laughs> which is the questioning. We call it question land, um, and uh, again, very enjoyable for for the kids and for us. Um, the last phase of the program, um, session seven and eight, are about um, developing data jams. In session seven they work on uh, a mini data jam we call it just to kind of give them a very small data set on ice and and then have them develop uh, a data jam right in their research club meeting um, but then there in session eight uh, we talk more about um, data jams and these can be done in a variety of ways i'm going to send you a link here in the chat uh, to the postcard that explains you know, what does data look like, right? We, we have these conceptions that it has to be a bar chart or a, a pie chart or something line graph, you know, something very traditional that we would learn in science class or math class. Um, but data can really look different to different people. So there's this video in the postcard called What Does Data Look Like? And it explores different creative ways of, of looking at information and observations and expressing them in different ways. Uh, one of my favorite projects covered in this video is one called Dear Data, where two colleagues basically sent each other postcards from England uh, to the US, uh, and they would give each other a topic every every month, I think it was, of, of how, you know, how they made observations together and comparing them, and it had to be an artistic rendering. This one that you see on the screen, and I encourage you to watch this video when you get a chance, is the number of laughs, you know, laughter. Were they making someone laugh, or, um, you know, did they, did someone make them laugh, right? And they use the colors and the, the number of petals on the flowers to represent laughter. And I just, I just love that. And you see on the, the left there are cakes, you know, this was done to explore different uh, science topics at Antarctica, um, at the field station there, the Palmer station, where the chef there is apparently amazing if they can make cakes like that. Um, but they explore different themes of what researchers are doing in Antarctica and the different technologies they're using, using cake, right? And so we, we share these ideas with kids to say, it's not always about line and charts. Um, you, can, you can express what you know and the observations that you're making in different ways, right? So, um, so that's the, the gist of it. But to get them warmed up there, as Sandra's scrolling there, you see there's three cutouts of the three different species, the chinstrap, the gentoo, and the Adeli. And we encourage the kids to make a group mural, if you will, um, that explains the changes in the three penguin populations. And um, we had tremendous luck with this. This is a fun group project, and you see one uh, shown here. First of all, it encourages the kids to understand ratios, because the first thing we say to them is, yeah, we can put numbers of penguins on the wall in different year classes here, but what we don't want to do is color in 14,000 breeding pair of penguins, right? So how are we going to create a representation of that that we can handle artistically <laughs> so they they learn about ratios right and one paper penguin equals 100 breeding pairs and they're able to scale their efforts and show not only the penguin uh, population shifts but also the shift in the ice you can see you know there's more ice in 1995 and a lot less ice <laughs> in 2010 um, in this particular case, this mural is from a school in Jersey City here in uh, in New Jersey, and uh, it was just a lot of fun. The facilitator's guide um, that I'll show you here, oh, I've got the blur on so you can't really see it, but um, this facilitator's guide walks you through all the details of how to do it. There's a full explanation of it here of how to how to do not only the group, um, activity, but also encourage kids individually to take their skills and talents, whether that be dance or sports or whatever it might be, and, and communicate the same trends over time, right, uh, of the penguins. Uh, and I'm reminded by one of our advisors that if, if you follow climate change communication, one of the key leaders in that is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. And one of her key recommendations is 
you know, we don't have to ask kids to have all the answers to climate change, right? It's they're they're not empowered to make these bold, you know, sort of systems level changes that will get us out of this crisis, right? Um, but one thing they can do, and the one thing that she encourages us all to do is talk about it, right? And to share what we know with others to increase its visibility and conversation, right? And that's what these data jams mean to us. You know, if they present them to family or friends or in group setting, community settings, that's increasing the conversation, right? And understanding of what is happening and hopefully will help generate um, action, community action versus regional versus global action, right? So the more we have our kids talk about it, the the better. <laughs> so this is where the data jams come in. And they're a very authentic way of, of getting them to talk about it. Um, so that's the notion and thoughts behind it. We did not create, I, if I didn't say this before, I wanna make sure I say it. Um, the data jam concept is one that the, um, the LTER program, which is an acronym for the Long-Term Ecological Research Program, there's a group out of the Asombro Institute in New Mexico that ter that coined the term data jam. And there are quite a few within the LTER network that use them as a tool. And now we're one of, of many sites that are using them as a, as a modality for increasing data literacy. So I just wanted to make sure you know that that was not something we generated, but something we're jumping on the bandwagon for. And the facilitator's guide has all the references, proper references to Dr. Stephanie Besselmeyer's work in data jams. Um, so I think our final closing thoughts, and we definitely want to open it up to questions for, for all of you, is this idea of going back to identity. And I think Sandra has a slide on this that one of our advisors helped us more recently kind of walk through. And I think it's really helpful to think about, you know, what are our goals here, going back to our goals? What do we want for our young people? Well, we want them to have these identity shifts, right? These ideas that, um, you know, you can have an interest in polar science. That's sort of one level, right? I'm interested in this and I might be a polar scientist one day um, to this idea that I'm interested in doing science in my community, right? Being more community um, focused um, to the idea that I'm a polar scientist who collects data and I might be have future engagement in something like the LTER program. Um, and, you know, the, the Coleroy to that is, you know, I am a scientist who collects climate data about my community. You can do that through things like globe or ICchange.org. These are very valid ways for kids to, right here and now, <laughs> collect their own, make their own observations and collect their own data, right? And then finally, the next level is I'm a polar science communicator, you know, through my data jam. Um, and we can also apply that more locally to I'm a science communicator who interprets my local data and, and communicates it to others in my community. And then the final one's my favorite, <laughs> which is I'm a change agent for a better world. Um, and I've shared my data jams and the implications for penguins to now I'm a change agent making my own community a better place in the face of climate change by doing these actions, whatever it might be, right? Um, so. So this is kind of the the shift, you know, that we're hoping um, to start. You know, do do we have it all figured out? No, <laughs> but these are these. This is our our first attempt, and I think a good foothold in how to get kids more engaged in these ideas. That again, that can generate a lot of confusion and anxiety. And ways to reduce that is by building their uh, STEM identity and also their self efficacy in interpreting data so that it can be more of an empowering um, experience for them, that they don't have to rely on others to interpret the data, that they can do it themselves. Um, so that, with that, that's the, the last slide I think we had, um, and I think we would love to, to chat with you more about all this and get your reaction, because um, although we've tested it in you know, 13 states, we would love to work with, with more of you to, to think about this more and develop the click to science, um, you know, sort of support system <laughs> for looking at data literacy and out of school time. Yes, it looks like Patricia had a question about oh, yeah. the Thanks, evaluation Patricia. sites. Yeah, so uh, some of them were in schools. Um, a lot of them were after school. Some the, the one that you saw featured in the video was um, Pat Hester Fearon, who teaches in a very urban school, um, very blue collar urban school just to our north here in New Brunswick. 
Um, and or she did it very interestingly where some of the lessons were done for the whole school, um, whole, her whole science class, if you will, during the school day. Um, but a lot of this kind of the question aspect and some of the nitty gritty of using code app and whatever was done in an after school club environment. So although it was in school, it really wasn't right like they were doing the bulk of the the really heavy lift, if you will, um, in an after school self uh, selected kind of um, version of it. And I would say most of our educators did it that way. There's probably a small percentage that did most of the work in school, but the vast majority of them did it in an at a school time um, environment. For example, in Trenton, uh, here in Trenton, New Jersey, which is a very, it's our state capital, but it's also a very urban setting. They, um, they did it with a nonprofit group called the Children's Home Society that focuses on immigrant children and they brought them in after school. Sometimes we were in housing authorities, after school uh, programs and housing authorities. Um, we were kind of in many, many, many different contexts and it didn't work the same in every context, but it worked at some level in every context. You know, there was just varying degrees of engagement, obviously, with different learning environments, but um, but overall, that that's how I would describe them. Does that help, Patricia? Janice, one of my thoughts is that this really would fit well into a lot of the summer programs in our our state, where they we have a lot of schools that have a, a after school program that starts at the end of summer school and. Um, they have a little bit more time that they could really explore this. Can we get copies of the curriculum now? Is it available? How do you get it the is. curriculum? Yeah, so there is a website that um, you can literally download everything uh, for free. Um, and recognizing that um, the postcards, I mean, obviously you can print them, but it's a, a little bit of work, right, to get all that material ready. So we are working with two different uh, line options. One is the 4-H supply. Which some of you may be familiar with. We just signed a contract with them to provide it through that at a minimal cost. And the other group that we've been strongly working with is STEMfinity, uh, which is another small curriculum house, if you will, that does, you know, kind of projects similar to this and provides. Uh, so this is to avoid the facilitator having to print all that stuff and, and get it all ready. This is just a, a ship a box to you and it's good to go. And to Sandra's point, um, they the STEMfinity people in particular are really interested in boxing it as a summer camp option um, because they feel that's the best use of it to be able to combine several sessions in a in a week afternoon thing as part of a bigger summer camp experience. STEM summer camp experience. So, um, so we'll see how how that goes. But that was certainly their preference. So um, we should have that up and running. I'm hoping by the end of April for ready for purchase for summer camp options. I, I really think the idea of taking a trip to Antarctica as part of your summer camp could be really fun. Yeah. And especially are... in hot environments, right? Like, yeah. yes, please take me to an icy place. <laughs> there, there are um, a lot of videos it in part, as part of the curriculum too we didn't watch all of them but there are some great videos that can give you that sense of what it's like to be at palmer station yeah we've had quite a few we call them scientist spotlights uh, and we tried to choose as as often as we could uh, scientists of color and different types of scientists gender culture uh, to talk about what it's like to to study in icy places and what kind of tools they use so that's a a, a nice um resource as well. Um, there's also, we didn't mention it, but there's also a series of what we call polar literacy videos. There's eight of them um, that just talk about, you know, different aspects of the polar regions and they were developed as part of this grant as well. So here's a link to the broader curriculum products, if you will. We, we've we been focusing on the purple box uh, when you look at this page, um, but there are, uh, there's an at home version. This was developed you know, for kids that want to do self-study, like almost like a record book, 4-H record book sort of, um, you know, self-study. And then the stuff in the green box are much smaller, you know, sort of four to five minute, you know, lessons, hands-on lessons that are paired with a scientist video um, that gives you that context. So they're, they're different ways of 
thinking about it, obviously the most, uh, the one we're most excited about is the purple box, the club version um, that I think handles those goals that we talked about earlier in the best way. Uh, but some of the other things I think could be useful too in different contexts. Are all the activities focused for middle school? I would say, uh, I would say we've used it as low as fourth grade and as high as middle high school. It really depends on your learning goals, but they can be scaled. For example, I'm doing a family science night uh, for a local urban school in about two weeks, and we're going to use quite a few of these activities um, in a tabletop demo type of mode, right? So I'll let you know how that goes. Uh, but yeah, there'll be a broad, broad range of age groups, obviously, with that, that we'll have to kind of scale and, and work with. Um, so I think it depends on the facilitator. But yes, I've used it as low as fourth and as high as like 10th grade. Um, we've also trained our teens to teach it to kids younger. So, um, so that's been fun. Uh, we have a program called STEM Ambassadors, uh, where we train about 60 um, kids from uh, uh, overburdened school districts that are underrepresented in STEM. And we work with them to train other kids at YMCA's and Boys and Girls Clubs and use the activities um, at their their level, right, um, in, in those after school environments. So that's been really fun. That's something we'll be working on this summer um, a lot more carefully um, as we train a new cohort of teens. Um, so yeah, it's been a work in progress, but um, you know, we're, we're grateful to Sandra and Kimberly and, and Anne for their collaboration. Um, this was a kind of a, a very entrepreneurial kind of cold call from me to them to say, hey, do you want to work with me on the broader data literacy piece? And I'm just really grateful for their collaboration. I just wanted to make sure um, that you knew that they've been great um, partners. And I think we're, we're genuinely excited to work together in the future and probably would invite all of you to um, to join us and as we explore this these ideas right of how do we teach this stuff in out of school time thank you janice and, and this is um janice's contact information is okay if i include yeah. that with the follow-up email as absolutely well. please do so we will be sending out a follow-up message to everybody who who registered so that you have the links that that we shared in, in the session today and, and you can find this information. We really appreciate your time. I do have just a little bit more information to share with you before we wrap up, but first I'm gonna end the recording